Hello, friends, and we are back with a, another lecture from our Black History Month programming. Today, beyond excited uh, to have Lucas Johnson and Erica Wilson discussing on social healing through conversation. Uh, as before, and as always, quick disclaimer, views expressed by the speakers and workshop facilitators do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of our organizing groups. Uh, all programming uses the Zoom meeting or Zoom webinar format. The webinar format is to prevent unexpected interruptions. It's not that we don't want to hear your voices and your questions. Questions for speakers can be submitted using the Q&A chat function, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. Also, all programming will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube site within 12 to 24 hours. Uh, like I said before, my incredible pleasure to introduce Lucas Johnson, um, who I will call a theologian, a master theologian. Um, Lucas is the executive director of the Civil Conversations and Social Healing for the On Being Project. You may be familiar with the On Being Project from its radio show or number of podcasts. The On Being Project was created to explore these difficult conversations that exist in our world and how we can improve society through uh, civil discourse. Lucas studied at Mercer University and Emory University's uh, Chandler School of Theology. Interesting, he was born in Germany, military brat, grew up in Georgia, now resides between Amsterdam and the U.S., living the dream that we all wish we could live, though I imagine it's only made much more complex in the age of COVID. Um, similarly, it is, I can't even begin to tell you how honored I am to have the majestic, the powerful, <laughs> the queenly Erica Wilson. Um, Erica Wilson's a palliative care doctor here at Massachusetts General Hospital. Many of you may not know what palliative care is or may have uh, heard some misconceptions about palliative care, but hopefully Erica will share uh, some of the work that she does with us. Uh, Erica received her undergraduate degree in computer science at Mount Holyoke College, her medical degree from the University of California in San Francisco. She completed an internal medicine residency at Cambridge Hospital in Cambridge, Massachusetts, went on to be a chief resident there and has been working and loving uh, her work at Mass General ever since. And without further ado, I will turn the conversations over to them. So let me stop sharing my screen and let me turn off my camera. And as luck would have it, I would sneeze just as, <laughs> just as Dan is turning the conversation over to us. Um, good, good morning, everyone, or good, good afternoon. Um, it's a, it's an honor to be here with you and to, offer some reflections um, on, on, on the theme, on, on, on what uh, our work um, around conversations has, ha, has to do with, with Black health and with healing. I, um, so first, let me talk a little bit about the On Being Project. Um, you know, our, our work, and as those of you who may have heard our, 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 the, our, our program on being with Krista Tippett, um, those of you familiar with it knows that um, that the, that show and all of our work centers around three animating questions. What does it mean to be human? How should we live? And who should we be to each other? Um, we have a, a, a practice really uh, inspired by Rilke, um, the, 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 the German poet and, and philosopher that uh, really, talks about and really is oriented around living the questions. Um, the Civil Conversations Project was started um, really in 2011 as, um, as we began to see, as, as Krista Tippett, our host and founder, began to realize that the, that the space in our uh, public life for people to engage in deep questions of, 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 uh, of meaning and deep, these deep uh, topics that are that are socially divisive, uh, that space for our public life for us to engage in that moral wrestling um, across lines of difference 
uh, was really absent. And that was, it was a time in our, um, in our world. And it's, it's strange to consider it now, given what we've been through in the past uh, several years, but it was a time when, when things were becoming more polarized and, and when people were aware that, um, that the, the heated political rhetoric was leading to um, uh, uh, greater uh, social uh, uh, division and, um, and even you know, episodes of violence. I, um, Krista Tippett decided to, to change the format of our show and to invite uh, uh, people to be in conversation with each other across lines of difference to engage in that sort of moral wrestling um, without uh, retreating to each other's uh, political sort of uh, trenches, uh, but to, to, to discover what questions they had in common and uh, what, the, uh, what the deeper sort of moral wrestling um, was there to be done um, in relationship. And uh, it's out of that project that, the, that, the, that this other aspect of our work that, that I'm here to speak about uh, grew because people uh, in that experience, as we aired the show, people began to write and say, you know, I've never heard a conversation like this. Uh, can you help us have a conversation like this? Or can we hear more? Or, or how, do you, how do you engage people across these lines of difference? Um, out of that uh, came uh, what we like to describe as our grounding virtues, uh, a distillation of, of some of the, 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 the principles that we bring to the conversations that we try to uh, encourage. And when we think about these grounding virtues, I like to describe them as, um, you know, it's not about things that are, um, that are foreign to us, They're, that really we're trying to call something forth in ourselves and each other that, that we are often familiar with, that we've seen modeled, but, but sometimes we've, we've not practiced. Um, so one of the things that, that uh, one of the, 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 the virtues that we try to speak to is uh, words that matter. Um, it's so often that um, we become distracted um, in our communication with each other or, uh, by words that don't really express what we feel, but that words that we've picked up somewhere that, um, that become sort of um, distracting uh, to the broader thing that we want to convey. So we try to encourage people to use words that actually represent what they, what they feel and what they hold, um, uh, but that also um, uh, have uh, or words that, that other people can access and, um, and relate to, um, but also words that, uh, that sort of um, invite us to see things, things uh, at a more human level. Uh, another thing that we talk about is hospitality. Um, we know uh, when we are in a room and someone is making things, is, is offering us hospitality, we know what that feels like, each of us do, and we know how to give that hospitality. We don't often think about a principle of hospitality in the context of a conversation, um, but it is something that can be offered, something that can be uh, uh, done. And I think that it's something that we, it's a, it's a sort of practice, a muscle to be trained in all of us. Um, and that, that can make all the difference. Sometimes we talk about humility, um, humility as a, as a companion to curiosity, um, and surprise. Um, humility is something that's essential when we're trying to be in conversation with one another. And I think we all know what, what that looks and feels like a lot of times, even if we have trouble practicing it ourselves, which of course we all do. Um, patience, um, generous listening, adventurous civil civility. We, um, you know, the word civility can in, it, in and of itself be distracting. Um, and I wanna, I wanna be clear about what we do and don't mean with that. I, it, it is not about 
shying away from difficult conversations. It is not about suppressing uh, people's legitimate expression of grievances. Um, for us, we're using that word to hearken uh, to our uh, commitments to being uh, together, to, to, the, to, to holding our, our civic life together. Um, and that's what that's in reference to. Um, I'll just say say this. I I um, in the context of our um, of our work, what's what's very important um, for us, and one of the kind of grounding truths for us is the fact that um, we we don't really get to choose whether or not we exist in relationship to one another. We just get to choose what the character of that relationship is. And we can go around and we can go about our lives sort of ignoring uh, uh, each other. We can, we can be in bad relationship to, with one another. Um, but, but the truth is we exist in relationship to each other. And so part of the question that we have to figure out is how we, how we live together, right? Um, you know, in our project, we encourage uh, uh, the work of inner life as a means of, of uh, understanding uh, outer life and, and life together. And, and we know that uh, the work to be in community takes, takes uh, inner work uh, as well as, as, as the, 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 the choices we make in terms of our behaviors. And it's not easily done and it's not easily achieved, but it's something that is essential for our human flourishing. Um, I, when reflecting and thinking about what I hope our work means um, I, for Black life in particular, um, it's, it's also important for me to say that, you know, part of my orientation to this work, so um, comes from the perspective that, um, you know, my, my background is in, you know, is in peace building and, and, and nonviolence. And I was, um, had the opportunity to really learn from people who, um, inspiring, remarkable, courageous people who, um, made, um, decisions to be in relationship in, in, in the most difficult experiences and places and, and times. And, um, one of the things that I, I, I take from that experience is this realization that for me, I feel like, you know, in the United States in particular, there's a way in which we've been a country at war with each other for a long time. Um, we've accepted a sort of low level persistent violence in our, in our lives um, and, in, and in the space and in the interactions between us. Um, in order for us to create the, the world we want to have, in order for us to live into something better, it, it's going to take us understanding what a different um, character of relationship, what a different quality of relationship can look like and can be. And it's going to take us modeling that in, in small ways and large ways. And when I think about what this means in the context of black health, I, I first and foremost think that um, I hope that our work in the world allows um, others who are not black to hear the stories of our lives and experiences um, with, 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 with greater depth and to learn and to understand more about uh, uh, what we have endured in our society, um, what we continue to endure, and, and how that has harmed not just our community, but the human community, period. Um, I hope that encouraging people to sort of develop those muscles of hospitality and generous listening allows for, for people who may have, uh, for, for those of us who are in the myriad of conversations that we're, we're sometimes called to be in in our daily lives with, with, uh, with, with majority cultures, to be able to be listened to, to have a softer landing, 
so that we may tell the truth of our experience or so that we may offer what wisdom uh, we have. I, I hope that our work might inspire the kind of inner life and the kind of, it, it might inspire people to create room in themselves um, to, to be hospitable to, to, to black life. Um, that's one thing that I hope. I think the, the other thing that I, that I wanna say in terms of what I hope our, our work means for, for black health is that I hope that it, um, and I intend for it to um, matter um, not just for the spaces, the conversations that we need to have with the dominant culture, but also for spaces and conversations that we need to have with each other. Um, you know, I think that uh, we all know that the Black community is not monolithic. Um, we know that um, there are lots of, um, you know, I, 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 one of the ways that I interpret what's what we've been through in the past several years is I look at us as having an opportunity right now to have to do um, some 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 remembering, right? Some coming together uh, of 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 our community. I think about um, uh, what we know happened um, after. Uh, uh, after segregation, and I know, uh, and 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 the ways that um, um, the 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 period of 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 integration uh, following the '68 riots, we know that what that did to Black communities, um, in terms of those who having the resources to to leave, leaving, um, creating sort of economic chasms between our communities, we know that 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 created some social divisions within the community because of such profound different experiences that would go on after that. We know that um, there are a myriad of people, uh, uh, you know, there are as many Black experiences as there are people, and there are lots of conversations we need to have with each other, um, conversations across uh, economic lines, conversations across gender and sexuality. Um, we have often not had the space to have those conversations with each other um, because uh, you know when you have your back against the wall for some of us you don't have the room to really engage in some of the difficult work that 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 even if you know that it's needed um, i hope that what we have to offer here is also a resource to those conversations for our community um, not just for the conversations that we need to have with the with, with uh, our society at large. Um, and so I, um, those are some of the reflections I wanna bring to you. I, 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 um, I look forward to uh, engaging more in conversation about all of this. Um, but uh, before we do that, I want to um, introduce or, or bring back to the conversation my, my dear friend, Erica Wilson, to offer reflections on, on her work and, uh, and what she sees as the connections here. Erica, you're muted. Thanks, Lucas. Um, I was just saying that I'm honored to be here. I love being in conversation with Lucas because he is so much more evolved than I am. <laughs> and he really um, takes my thinking to, um, to, to higher higher levels. Um, I'll start by, by just talking a little bit about the work that I do as a clinician in palliative care, because uh, it really, it ties into some of the work that the communication work that Lucas was just talking about. So as a, as a specialty, we deal with um, the whole of the patient and the family, we try to, and that includes um, attending to people's physical health. Um, we're experts in symptom management, uh, social and emotional health, spiritual health, the health of the family and, and relationships between the family. And so a large part of the work that we do is engaging in conversations with patients, with clinicians, with the teams taking care of patients, 
um, and the and the collection of communities, both family and uh, and found family that 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 people have as part of their lives. And so many of the things that Lucas talked about really resonate with me about choosing words that matter, about hospitality so that people feel welcomed and seen. Um, we take care of patients who have serious illness. And so um, what goes along with serious illness, as you can imagine, is a whole plethora of, of things that involves the patient and the community that they live in. And that can be both tremendous suffering, physical suffering, um, the suffering that comes from having to change your role in the family or the way you live your life, quite literally, you know, whether you are able to, to walk or take care of yourself. It is also a space that can, um, can really open up um, new ways of thinking for, for patients and families. It's, it's a, it's a, it, there's a space there where there's a tremendous um, opportunity to grow and talk about things that, that matter. Um, being ill has a way sometimes of really sharpening the focus um, and, and what we do is we try to um, help people draw on the things that make them resilient. And that can be prayer, that can be meditation, that can be music, that can be food, that can be friends. Um, so finding those things that, that really lift their spirit and help them cope with what is going on. And then, and then really also think about planning for what, what might happen. And so how do we make sure as a system, we are thinking collectively about um, how to best care for this particular patient in the context they're in. And there are a lot of um, implications for, for black health, for the health of black people and black families in this setting of, of managing serious illness. Um, there is tremendous resilience in, um, in Black communities, as Luca said, not monolithic, but it is universally true that there are uh, tremendous um, resources that, um, that communities that have in large part been through um, been through difficulty. Um, and, and living with, um, in, a, in a culture, in a world that is not always hospitable, that out of that grows a, um, just tremendous resources and, and ways of coping. And, you know, the, it, it is not a, it is not a um, mistake that um, Black people are at you know, the forefront of a lot of music and, and culture and activism and, um, and that, that, that some of that is comes out of uh, need. And um, in our culture, there is a disproportionate weight of um, the, the incidence of chronic illness. So there's more chronic illness uh, in the Black community and, um, and often the effects of that are, are larger. So that there have been, there are studies done that show that um, even if you take out things like um, income or residence, the things that, that, that can affect health, that the health, when they compare um, people in the same socioeconomic status, and, and black people and, and, and white people or non-black people, that um, people have that black people often have worse outcomes, and so um, to my mind, there is a real importance and need um, in communities of color and, and in in the black community for us to think together, using careful words and hosp hospitality, to think about how we manage this well. Um, for the individual patient and for our community as a whole. And so we, I spend a lot of time thinking about how to engage 
um, people of color and black people in, in these uh, discussions. Um, so that's, that's my thought about how the intersection of, of palliative care and, and medicine and, and conversation So, Erica, I, I was thinking about, um, you know, the space that, you know, the, where sort of the, the space where your work and my work come together, which I think is often, is probably often the case for you. I mean, I, I think that, I think that when you're, when you're treating a patient and you're there with a patient, I, you know, the, the broader kind of social realities that that are present with that person are also there in your conversations with that person's family um, and their assessment of the choices they have to make. Um, I'm wondering how do you make decisions about what can be addressed when, right? Like how do you you know, they're, 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 it's almost as though I, I feel like, you know, all the, cover I imagine that, that there are many different conversations that needed to, to happen, that it's unfortunate that, 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 that they're happening at this point, or that, that everyone's together to have them at this point, and there's a whole sort of world of conversation that is sort of beyond this moment, right, mm -hmm. that, that you have to sort of contain to be had elsewhere. Um, or at another time or something, something, I, I, how do you, how do you move between that, uh, those, those realities? It can be super difficult. And, um, and what, what, what I do, what we do is we, um, we use, employ the tactics that you talked about, which is really generous listening. And so we listen carefully to the words and what might be behind the words. And then so, so sometimes the, the thing to do is to acknowledge what might be present in the room. So, um, you know, sometimes um, there is suspicion or worry that, um, they're, that this person is not getting all the care that they need because of the history of of racism that is ongoing in our in our medical care, and so sometimes naming that and um, and kind of sitting with that together and making sure that questions are answered, that the right specialists have been involved, um, and sometimes you're right. There are things that that we can't address and we can't. Um, uh, it's, it's not. It won't be helpful to to surface and. Some of that is, you know, we feel our way around in these conversations. Um, I'm just, I'm thinking of a patient who I took care of um, for almost, for about eight months this, this year, all of it here in the hospital, who, um, who really was a tremendous teacher for me. Um, and she, um, she was from the Midwest, so she's not from here, so far away from her, her community, her loved ones. And she was deeply connected to her community and, um, but came here because we're a referral center and a, and a special, and we have specialty here that, that can't be uh, gotten other places. And so that, that um, how to support people when they're physically away from their, support systems um, is, a, is a big part of what we do. Um, she's someone who had, um, she had a large body and, um, and that comes with particular issues in the hospital and healthcare um, that, you know, she talked about feeling unseen. Um, and, and so there, there are, there are ways in which we can have conversations over time. Ideally, we have start these conversations very early. And my, my particular belief is that, um, that oftentimes these conversations need to happen very upstream, particularly in communities where there is um, 
a history of not being treated well in the, in the medical world. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, I, I wonder if, it, if, 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 if maybe this might be a time to open up to, to conversation with those, those, of, those of you who are attending, who are joining us. Um, I, uh, Dan has told us that um, you can enter questions in the Q&A se section if you have any questions for uh, Erica or I. Um, I actually had a question just to quickly come in. Um, so we had asked Erica, you know, when is it time? But I imagine also, Lucas, in the work that you do, right, with some of these big social issues and different groups of people, you're also faced with this question of when is the right time? How do you, how do you, connect two groups with opposing views and get them to meet in the middle, especially now as we're so divided and, you know, we're much more likely to call people enemies than friends. Yeah, well, so, I mean, part of it is, I mean, uh, my, my orientation to this work, I mean, my, um, is really inspired by um, uh, a sort of conflict uh, methodology called conflict transformation, which was, um, which I consider sort of pioneered by the Mennonites. And, and that is an orientation of conflict that allows us to um, really look at um, the opportunity that that conflict presents, right? Because you're you're not if 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 you if you're really oriented around the importance of relationship, then you recognize that when you're in conflict with someone, it's most often around something that matters, right, to them. And so there's an opportunity for you to really see and for you to really learn what really matters to them and what's at the heart of what of 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 what the the conflict is about. And so I I don't try to get people into some middle, right? I, I try to see what they're expressing that matters. And I try to sort of orient the conversation around what matters. And the thing is, it's often the case that when you, when you, when you peel back the layers of what's being said, then, you know, what matters to them will matter to their opponents to you know, they're often sort of human concerns. And, when, and when, when we're able to be vulnerable with each other and when we're able to sort of engage each other with humility, then we'll be able to kind of concede that, you know, our opponent's concerns are our concerns too. We may have drawn different conclusions, but at some point we'll have, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll get to a point where we understand why those conclusions were drawn and, and it's in that sort of space of empathy that something can be transformed, something new can be, uh, uh, can, can arrive. And, and, and I, you know, I don't, it's not about sort of getting us to some, getting the, the, the group of people to some, some middle or to some place that we were before. It's about the opportunity to arrive at some place completely new um, uh, and in a new quality of relationship because now we understand each other more. And so those, those, those virtues that I mentioned about that are really oriented around a sense of curiosity that we might have for each other, I think, um, you know, are really helpful in sort of helping us approach those conversations and, and have the right kind of disposition um, to be able to engage each other across those lines of difference. Does that, does that speak to your question, Dan? Definitely. That is uh, quite heavy, I have to say. <laughs> so it, it's not even so much that it's, there's, there's no, there's not necessarily a resolution in conversation. It's more of just using conversation as a tool for everyone to reach a new space, which hopefully they may be closer together in. 
Yeah. Uh, Erica, you look like you want to say something. Well, I was, I, 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 you know, I, I think about this in a, in kind of a more narrowed sense of in the, in the hospital, I work in the hospital, there are palliative care providers who work outside, but it is like getting, it is getting to the heart of something. And that sounds, um, that sounds kind of namby pamby or not meaningful, but, but it actually is that meaning is what makes things possible to change. And so like just on a, on a, in a pragmatic way, there will be times where there's conflict in, in families where, you know, one person wants a particular treatment and the other person, you know, does not, let's say. And when you get to what is actually important, it is often that there is a lot of um, agreement. You know, the, what's important is often, I love you and, you know, I want to spend time with you. And so the pursuit of the treatment is to have more time and or to have better quality time. And so if we can, if we can hear the, the arguments about, um, you know, going to transplant or, or, um, or pursuing more chemotherapy or getting a, a, an operation, and if we can help people dig underneath that to what's important, it can actually help um, it can help with decision making. It help, can help people see each other in a new way, and it's through that seeing that you can um, you can arrive at new places. and And that's when sometimes we can think really outside of the box. Like it's act, it's not critical that the chemotherapy happens now. Maybe what should happen is you you know go off to the beach with your family for for three weeks and really have some important time together and then come back and finish treatment. So, um, you know, it's not, not in the large social context that, that Lucas was talking about, but, but, the, but that ability to get underneath to what is important allows people to find connection in, in new ways. Yeah, I mean, I, I think about, I, I think it's our natural human impulse sometimes and it's, it's not, it's also a kind of cultural impulse that, um, that needs, that, that ought to be examined in a, in a lot of spaces and contexts and moments, but we want the problem to be solved, right? We want to just, we want to just kind of, this is, this is the problem and this is how we, this is, this is going to be solved. And it reminds me of you know, so I, I had the, you know, I mentioned earlier, I was mentored by veterans of the civil rights movement. And one of my closest mentors was a man named Vincent Harding. And he worked closely with Dr. King and, and, and others. And uh, I called him Uncle Vincent. And um, there would be these moments when I would say to him, Uncle, you know, it's like, Uncle Vincent, like, why, like, aren't you just tired of having to just do this? Like, just to keep having these same conversations over and over again, isn't that just exhausting to you? And, you know, he would kind of laugh in this very loving way. And he would say to me, well, you know, we didn't, what did you think we did all this so that you could rest, you know? Uh, um, and it was sort of this reminder that that's not the way, that's not the way it works in a sense that like we don't, the reason why the point is relationship is precisely because you never get to a point where you have to start stop teaching people the right orientation to human community, right? That just doesn't happen. And so um, you, 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 you have to sort of keep going. And I guess what I'm getting at is that um, we, um, you know, the, 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 the point of, you know, no, Andrew Young, who's another sort of elder vet, veteran of the movement, used to say that, you know, racism is a sickness. He, he, would, he was quoting his father. He said, his father used to say that racism is a sickness and you don't get, you don't get mad at sick people, you, you treat them, right? And, um, and I, I take that with a grain of salt. Of course, you get, you get mad at sick people sometimes. That's true. That's, I, I, you all know the nuance and complexity in that, but you get the point that he was making. Um, 
the 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 what I'm what I'm referencing that to say and what I'm marshalling that to say is to say that that you know we don't wake up someday and um become anti-racist or or become but you know people don't wake up and I, you know I it, it is a it is a process and it's a journey and what what we have to do is we have to orient ourselves towards um towards uh the the right questions like i don't i don't know all the ways to show up um against sexism i, I don't i don't know all the all the right answers all the time i have to be oriented towards the, the the will to do that and that is a sort of relationship with with the goal and that is a sort that is a relationship with the women in my life in my life right like it is not it is not something that i get to sort of get a get a card and punch and say i've taken all the courses i've done all the training and so now i'm now it's over it, it is about how do we orient ourselves to this to these common common concerns and so all of our work i think that we sometimes approach our our justice work from this orientation that we're going to do it it's going to be done and then and then and then the world will be better and and i think oftentimes we exhaust ourselves because we we don't prepare ourselves to do this work for the long haul and we and we 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 we, we prepare ourselves for a sprint and not and not the marathon that it is no matter what our elders have already told us we we forget all of that and it's not that i'm saying that we shouldn't be focused on the sort of it's not that i'm saying that sort of uh impatience is wrong in the face of injustice i, I it's right to be impatient impatient it's right to want things to be resolved immediately um indeed they have to be but my friend jen bailey likes to say that the pace of how does she say it? the pace of the pace of change is happens at the or change happens at the pace of relationship, right? Because we're humans and human, the work of human transformation is, is sometimes gradual. Um, and when you're talking about systems, um, it's, it's, it's important to remember that it's people that make up those systems. And so even in our systemic analysis, even in our systemic engagement, we have to be mindful of the process of human change. Um, and um, I, I think that I've kind of veered far from the original question that prompted this, but <laughs> so I'll, I'll, but your, I'll, your I'll, teaching yeah. of conversation would argue that, you know, it isn't necessarily important if you veer away, because from it, we've all come to a higher understanding of the purpose of con conversing. So that's, that's in that way. Cover, Dan. No, well, I mean, you know, this is something that I've never really thought about, especially as a radiologist, um, where I'm usually speaking into the ether, and then the patient or the doctor receives a report of what I see. There's no conversation there. Um, so, you know, as we get kind of close to the end of the time, you know, I'm, I think there is some urgency in discussing how do we put what we've learned here into practice, right? Because as we are, as every group organization in the United States is thinking, well, how can we be anti-racist? Or maybe we expand that to how do we become a society which is more accepting and empowering of all people? You know, how, how can, you know, your average person punching a clock use conversation in such a way to help make a more equitable and welcoming world? I only ask the easy questions, right? <laughs> you want to take that one, Lucas? Oh, well. You going to fix it? <laughs> um, well, the first thing I, I often kind of um, uh, offer a sort of disclaimer if you will, um, it's not, it's, it's important for me to also say that, um, you know, this is, 
the inner work is important um, and it's necessary and it's necessary to kind of know where you are um, in terms of your ability to have conversations. And it's also not necessary for you to have every conversation every time, right? So I think that um, in our work with each other, um, uh, there are times when we will be tired. There are times when we won't have the sort of emotional capacity to really show up with curiosity. And I think it's important to know that. I think it's important to also sometimes name that for the people that you're in relationship with, right? Um, and I think there's an act of vulnerability in doing that. I think oftentimes we don't name that and we just kind of uh, react um, from our place of exhaustion or, or, or woundedness and pain. And then, and then we have to, if we choose to, we have to come back, go back and clean that up. But I think that it, but doing the inner work to sort of understand where you are is, I think, the first and probably most important part of, of this process. Um, understanding, you know, th th these notions that these things that I mentioned earlier are sort of like, how are you moving into the conversation in a hospitable way? Um, if, you know, thinking about like, are you, the, are you in a position of power? And are you, are you, is it therefore hospitable if your subordinate is, is trying to uh, engage you in this conversation? Thinking about, thinking about all of these questions that, that make up hospitality. If you were inviting someone into your home, many of us come for cult from cultures with rich traditions of hospitality. Like, you know, what, do you, what does it mean to set the table for this conversation? What does it mean to set the table for this relationship? Um, you know, thinking about that, I think uh, uh, it's it, maybe it seems impractical, but I, I think that I'm I'm hoping that when I when I reference these things, they conjure up sort of thoughts and images that actually lead to practical advice. I hope that's the case. Um, so those are two things that come to mind, and I'll I'll just stop there. I I might add that that. Um... You know, in in palliative care, we take care of symptoms. We 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 think about emotional life and and, and social life. And I think the same is is true in this space of um, working for um, equality and and um, and justice. And that is that the inner work and the conversation and and curiosity and hospitality are are critically important as a foundation and that, um, that we also act in the way that supports our, our words. And so, you know, Lucas mentioned if, if you're a person who has some power, then there are things that you can do that you should, that we need to do as well as, um, as use our speech wisely is what I would say. Um, and particularly in healthcare, um, I think there are ways that we need to very actively um, think about the way we have provided care up till now and, and, and change some things so that we can, um, we can work to make our world you know, match the, um, the hopes that we, we talk about. Great. You know, I'd like to thank both of you so much. This has been like enlightening, uh, interesting. It's, you know, we're trying this new way in which we celebrate Black History Month by um, inviting the community into these conversations, right? And that involves, you know, not just highlighting the work of hospital staff, but community voices like yours, Lucas, because you are an expert in this space of communication. And it just happened that Erica is also an expert in this space. And so bringing the two of you together has been a very kind of like broad overview of the power that communication can have. And I think, you know, when, when we put this this program together, we didn't necessarily know where it was going to go. 
um, but we knew that it was an important experience for people to have and people to participate in. And I think, you know, we've accomplished just that. So I would like to say to both of you, you know, thank you so much. And to the audience, of course, uh, those that are here now and those that are watching the recording, um, you know, this is something that we should all kind of sit with, think about and figure out how we can utilize in our daily practices. So once again, thank you both very, very much.